Welcome everyone. It's not snowing and it's not raining and it's not sleeting. So thank you for coming. Um, just one reminder, please turn off your cell phones. And now Sandy Baird is going to introduce our speaker. So today we have the honor and pleasure of hearing Professor Nicole Phelps from UVM where she is an associate professor of history with a specialty in the Habsburg Empire. Who knew? <laughs> anyway, uh, she also is a graduate of the University of Minnesota where she got her PhD and also her MA and she has a BA from the George Washington University. She has a, a resume that I'm, I'm, it's too long to really summarize, it's 14 pages, uh, full of many of her articles and publications and her very many awards. I will introduce her mainly by saying she is a fabulous professor. I took her class on World War I at UVM and it's with great pleasure that she's here to speak to us today about the Versailles Treaty. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone for being here. Um, so, I am delighted to be addressing a very different kind of audience than I usually do, and hopefully I've pitched my talk correctly. Um, as I was contemplating what it was uh, that I was going to say um, a couple of days ago, I was like, okay, what am I going to say? The Paris Peace Conference. And then I went and looked at the website, and I realized that I had been given an actual question to answer, which was, the Treaty of Versailles, did it bring peace? Which totally changed what I was thinking about telling you. But, so, the Treaty of Versailles, did it bring peace? No. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> um, no. um, so I'd like to um, kind of talk today about three ways um, in which the treaty failed to bring peace. Um, and one of those is to talk about how it was kind of an incomplete legal conclusion to the war. Um, I'd also like to talk about the kind of ongoing on the ground violence that was happening um, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, um, while the peace conference was going on and uh, following that for the next several years. Um, and then I'd also like to think kind of more broadly um, about a century's worth of nationalist and anti-colonial violence um, that um, certainly the treaty didn't stop um, and we might argue that the treaty helped to create. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going today. Um, okay, so if we think about the legal side of things, um, you know, one, uh, one way of thinking about what a war actually is, um, is that it's a different uh, set of legal relationships between governments. Um, there's broken diplomatic relations um, and then declarations of war um, that mean that some countries are belligerent powers and other countries are neutral in the conflict. Um, and so if we're thinking about World War I, um, and kind of remembering who's on what side of this. Um, you know, we have the, the four central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. Um, and within, mostly by the end of 1914, um, but definitely um, by mid-1916, um, we have the, uh, a, a range of allied powers who are fighting against the central powers. Um, everyone from the British and the French, um, also the Russians, the Japanese, uh, Italy, Portugal, all sorts of people. Um, and then, of course, um, as the war goes on, in 1917, the United States enters the war, um, but they, when they do that, um, they radically alter the war. There's many other states that follow the United States into the war. Um, including many countries in Central and South America, um, also China, Siam, Liberia. Um, and so what we end up with then is a set of altered legal relationships among all of these different, um, different participants. And sometimes when we think about, okay, so when did the war end? Um, people often focus on the armistice. Um, and in particular, they focus on November 11th, 1918. 
Um, and of course, an armistice is an end to fighting, um, but it's not an end to the disrupted wartime legal relationships um, that the war had, that a war had created. Um, and of course, also when we're thinking about the November 11th, 1918 armistice, um, we're really only thinking about Germany. The other central powers had left the war previously. Um, so Bulgaria has an armistice in September of 1918. Um, the Ottomans uh, have an armistice in October of 1918. And the Austro-Hungarians um, in um, a, about a week earlier, um, in November of 1918. And again, so, okay, we have, we have a stop to certain types of fighting in the war. But it's really, really crucial for us to remember that when the armistice happens, there's still a lot of wartime stuff and wartime disruption that's still happening. One of the most important things that's still going on um, is the Allied blockade of Europe, um, which in particular um, is preventing uh, food supplies from getting to Germany and Austria-Hungary. Um, and that blockade is not lifted with the armistice. It continues on. Um, and we should also think about the fact that there's still thousands and thousands of soldiers deployed. There's still thousands of prisoners of war in camps. Um, and all of the kind of logistical apparatus that was necessary to accommodate those people, to feed them, to house them, to clothe them, all of that system is continuing on in place. Um, with the possibility that the fighting may start again, that the armistice might not be over, um, but certainly what I'm trying to say is that a war does not stop on a dime, okay? Um, and, and so we have all of this stuff that's still going on. The peace conference itself, um, I don't, I'm not gonna spend too much time on, this is something that's been covered um, in a lot of popular histories, um, but um, it's, a, it's a complex process, and it's more complex than the picture of Woodrow Wilson and David Lloyd George and George Clemenceau that is usually how it's represented. Like, I thought about putting that picture up there, and I was like, no, I don't wanna reinforce that. <laughs> um, so, um, the, there's an initial kind of planning um, start to the conference in December of 1918, um, and here you have representatives of the four major allied powers or allied and associated powers, because um, the United States calls itself an associated power, not an allied power. They want some freedom of action um, kind of within uh, their cooperation with the other allies. Um, so we have the British, the French, the Americans, the Italians who are doing some planning about what a peace conference might look like. Um, and they decide, without really thinking it through, um, that they want to invite representatives of all of the other allied countries to come to Paris kind of as soon as possible. And so that kind of formal start to the Paris Peace Conference um, happens in January of 1919. Um, that's also when President Wilson arrives in Paris. Um, and so you have this large group of people um, representing several dozen countries who are in Paris ready to remake the world. And the big four hadn't really thought how they were going to entertain all of those people, um, kind of what they were going to have them do. Um, and they partially came to realize that that was way too many people to make a lot of specific and important decisions and maybe they didn't care what the Brazilians and the Cubans thought about all of these issues anyway. Um, and so the kind of general body of the peace conference um, is broken up dealing with a bunch of large issues like um, the possibility of uh, creating an international labor organization that's going to govern workers' rights. And you have a group that's working on thinking about the League of Nations. Um, and you have a group that's thinking about um, kind of how new rules of aviation should work, because World War I is kind of when we get the introduction of, of airplanes. Um, and so they're, they're kind of doing their thing, um, and then you have 
um, a range of smaller committees where you have representatives um, from the big four countries and some smaller countries depending on the question. And they're doing kind of a lot of the real work of negotiating what's going on. And then you have the, the big four um, who are having the highest level of discussion. Um, and the plan initially was that the, this, this conference that all of the allies were at was going to be like a, a pre-conference because the idea was that then they were going to invite representatives of the former central powers governments to come and negotiate and sign a treaty. That was the model that had been used very successfully at the Congress of Vienna um, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Everybody kind of buys into the system. Um, but their process of trying to figure out what the basic terms would be before they could start that larger peace conference dragged on and on and on for months. And they realized that they needed to stop the peace conference and not do that other bit. Um, and so in June of 1919, uh, they summoned the representatives of the German government um, to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Um, again, so they never got to the part of actually like negotiating with the other central powers. Um, and so at that point, um, you know, Wilson and David Lloyd George, they leave Paris. Um, but the peace conference is actually still going on because there's still all kinds of issues that lower level people are working on. Um, and ultimately, the Paris Peace Conference uh, just kind of morphs into the League of Nations on January 1st, 1920, um, with much the same kind of committee structure and some of the same personnel. Okay, so I, I'd be happy in the Q&A to say more about how all of that actually worked. Um, but to move on here, um, what's important, one of the things that's important to keep in mind about this is that the Treaty of Versailles is just with Germany, okay? And so it doesn't end kind of all of the legal disruption and the wartime disruption um, that was caused by the war. Um, so we have a, a cartoon here, um, the, uh, the big four dental treatment, okay, so the, the, um, the Germans, Germans had been called to Paris, they have their peace treaty terms, um, and we have the Bulgarians and the Turks and the Austro-Hungarians uh, waiting their turn and being very concerned about what's going to happen to them um, as a result of, of, of their appointments. Um, and in fact, um, the, the process of d getting peace treaties with those other countries is long and drawn out. Um, so Austria um, is um, actually is fairly quick. Um, they are obliged to sign their treaty, uh, Treaty of Saint-Germain, um, in September of 1919. Uh, the Bulgarians have a treaty in November of that year. Um, but then it takes longer. Um, the Ottomans um, have a treaty in August of 1920, um, and the Hungarians in September of 1920. Um, so it's, it's a long, drawn-out process. And of course, we should also keep in mind that when we're talking about a treaty, signing a treaty is not the same thing as ratifying a treaty. Okay, so there's, there's plenty of treaty out there that have been negotiated and signed but never entered into force um, because they weren't ratified. And different countries have different systems for how treaties are ratified based on the structure of their government. Um, but certainly for the United States, um, that process requires a vote um, by two thirds of the US Senate. Now, when Wilson, uh, so Wilson didn't like a lot of people. I, I think that actually just, su just sums it up. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like most of the people in the State Department. He didn't really like a lot of other politicians. Um, and so he, he was very interested in kind of keeping the peace process as much kind of just with him as possible. 
Um, and that, those, that kind of famous picture of Lloyd George and, um, and Clemenceau and Wilson kind of suggests that they were really able to do that. Um, but the, the American delegation in Paris, the American Commission to Negotiate Peace, had more than 1,000 members, okay? Um, and so they're on a variety of different committees. Um, there's a bunch of military um, officials who are part of the committees. Um, a lot of the, the people um, are um, people who were hired to do post-war planning and hired to work at an organization called the Inquiry, um, which has subsequently become the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, but the idea was to keep post-war planning out of the State Department. Anyway, so these thousand plus Americans that are there contributing to constructing this treaty includes zero Republican senators. <laughs> and they have the majority in the Senate. Um, and so Wilson, a Democrat, um, is setting himself up for major problems when it comes to ratification because he hadn't been doing the work of trying to get of domestic buy-in for the treaty, and in particular, um, domestic buy-in from the Senate. Um, and so the Senate, um, as many of you may know, um, they propose a series of reservations to the treaty, so parts that they're not gonna follow or additions um, that they want to put in there. And they're thinking, you know, they're, what they're really aiming for are two things. One is to, and have maintained the United States' ability to act unilaterally in foreign policy, so on its own, without having to work with other people. Um, but the Senate is also particularly concerned about protecting Congress's role um, in foreign policy. So they don't want a treaty um, that is self-executing, um, so they, they wanna make sure that the House continues to have its power over the budget, they want to make sure that the Senate has it continues to have its power uh, to um, advise and consent on treaties, which is what the Constitution tells them they're supposed to do. And so they make these changes, and they actually vote on the treaty twice, and both times it fails. Um, we have a, a political cartoon here um, that so we, it's called the Accuser, um, and so we have humanity here, pointing the finger of blame, and also the, figure, the finger to God. God is doing the blaming through humanity. Um, blaming the uh, US Senate here for either mortally wounding or killing uh, the peace treaty. Um, and you know, so it is a very big deal that the United States doesn't ratify this treaty. Um, the first time that, they, that the Senate votes no, um, Wilson then goes on a big um, uh, tour of the United States to try and get people, the public, to approve the treaty, you know, to write to their senator. Um, he works so hard on that that he has a stroke and a bunch of other health issues. Um, and so basically he is, um, for the last year or so of his presidency, he's actually not functioning as the president. Um, and there's no constitutional provisions for dealing with that yet. Basically, his wife is the president. Um, and so the Senate votes again, and they reject it a second time. So the United States actually has to separately get out of its legal conflict um, with the central powers. Um, and so the United States doesn't sign treaties um, until 1921 um, with Germany, with Austria and with the new Hungary. Um, there's no treaty with the Bulgarians or the Ottomans because the United States had never declared war on them, um, and so they don't need to kind of fix that legal relationship. Again, kind of the United States on the whole, um, the Senate um, is really recommitting to the idea of American unilateral action. We often are, hear this as, saying that the United States retreats to isolationism. Um, and I would caution against that. Um, Americans continue to be actively involved um, in foreign policy. They continue to be actively involved economically. 
Um, and it's more about protecting the Americans' ability to act on their own, to make their own decisions about how they want to engage with the rest of the world, um, rather than committing to the League of Nations or a more permanent military alliance. Okay. So we have this kind of legal story about um, ending the war. And we can see that it's much messier, it's certainly not November 11th, 1918, um, but, but it's, it's much messier um, because of all of those relationships that have to be adjusted and formally closed. Okay. So then um, I wanna kind of think about what's happening on the ground when the Paris Peace Conference is happening. As we saw, the conference um, took six months just to deal with Germany, and they're still working for quite some time after that. Um, and the people, a lot of the people at the Paris Peace Conference seemed to sort of have this idea that the rest of the world had just stopped. And that they were waiting for the people at Paris to say, here, Here's where the borders are. Here's who your government is. Um, but the world doesn't really work that way. Um, and so what we have on the ground is people who are trying to stay alive, trying to figure out how, what they need to do to get the blockade to stop, um, who are trying to think about what, you know, if, if their countries are gonna be broken up or radically reorganized, how do they um, how do they get the best stuff? Um, so they're, they're thinking about um, you know, what they can do to try and get the best possible outcome for this. Um, and there's lots of violence that's involved in that. Um, so you know, one example, um, in Hungary, which is now, so, so Austria-Hungary gets broken up into different pieces, um, and the Hungarians um, are, you know, they had been used to being it's actually a pretty big kingdom with lots of pieces that they had had for about a thousand years. Um, and now they're reduced to a significantly smaller area. Um, and the Romanians invade Hungary because they're trying to take over big parts of it. Um, the, the Czechs um, had decided that they wanted to have a state with the Slovaks. And the, the Czechs had always been part of Austria, but the Slovaks had always been part of Hungary. Um, so the Hungarians are trying to hold on to the Slovaks. Um, so we have lots of violence there in Central Europe. Also, um, in the Ottoman Empire, um, we have, in particular, the Greeks and the Italians who are looking to expand their territorial holdings. Um, and so there's warfare um, into the early 1920s um, in Anatolia. Um, and, and I raised this question, are they fighting the Ottomans or are they fighting the Turks? Um, because that's one of the other things that's going on, is that the Ottoman Empire is collapsing um, in part because it lost the war, um, but also because there's a movement of Turkish nationalists um, who want to take over the government. Um, and so they actually end up needing to do another end of World War I treaty um, when it comes to the Middle East um, because the, the Turks who took over the former Ottoman government, um, they rejected the 1920 treaty um, and, and pretty much rightly so because they had kind of completely changed the borders of their country. Um, and they certainly had changed its governing structure. Um, and so in 1923, um, we have the Treaty of Lausanne, um, which is kind of ending the war again um, in the Middle East, um, and also kind of dealing with that um, Greek and Italian conflict. And so you get kind of the, the country of Turkey um, like we know it today. Um, and then, of course, the other place where there's huge amounts of fighting is all of Asia. <laughs> um, and so the, the Russian Revolution, um, the Bolshevik Revolution, which had started in 1917, um, that is um, continuing to produce lots and lots of violence. Um, and I have a couple of maps here um, to show some of it. 
Um, so, of course, so we have the Bolsheviks are trying to gain control of the country, um, and we have people who are Russians who don't want them to be in control. Um, but there's also um, all sorts of violence kind of at the European edge of the empire. Um, Finland, which had been part of Russia, it declares its independence. The Baltic states declare their independence and get taken back over by the Russians. Uh, Poland um, gets created at the Paris Peace Conference, but it's also in a war with Russia while they try and figure out where the, the boundaries are. Um, there's fighting in Belarus and Ukraine. Um, and then there are um, kind of Americans and British and French troops who are landed kind of in the northern part of Russia here um, to try and help prevent um, the communist takeover of Russia. Um, and you have, um, well, so this is the Kolchak's government. This is the kind of white Russian government that's attempting to block the Soviets. Um, you can see here, allies and Czechoslovaks. So you have, you have Czech prisoners of war who left, broke out of their prisoners of war camp um, and were attempting to, um, to get home. Um, they were going the long way. Um, they were not going like west towards Europe. They were going east. Um, with the idea of hitching a ride when they got to the Pacific. And the reason they're doing that is because they're, they're walking along the Trans-Siberian Railroad um, and they're expecting less conflict in that direction. Um, and, and they're fighting Bolsheviks along the way um, and the Americans and the Japanese land troops um, at the Pacific coast and invade Russia that way to try and assist uh, the Czechoslovaks. Um, so, okay, so this one is from December of 1918. Um, when we look um, about a year later, in January of 1920, um, we can see how much the Soviets have, have consolidated their control. Um, we can see, um, so this is at a point where we still have this kind of independent uh, set of Baltic states that's not gonna be there in like another year. Um, and we have, uh, but we still have the Soviets who are uh, trying to deal with their Asian borders. Um, and by this point, the, um, the British and the French and the Americans had left, but the Japanese are still there. Um, and their fighting between the Japanese and the Russians um, goes on until January of 1925, um, when they signed the Soviet-Japanese Basic Convention. Um, and so arguably, this is what ends World War I for Japan um, with the Soviets. Um, but there's one important bit that they couldn't come to a resolution on, um, and that is Manchuria, which is the kind of really uh, valuable kind of um, access to the Pacific. Um, and if, I, I presume that my esteemed colleague, Professor Buchanan, talked about this if he was talking about World War II. Um, many historians would like to date the beginning of World War II as the 1931 Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Um, so basically, it doesn't get settled in World War I, and it's the kind of festering element um, that starts uh, World War II kind of in the Asian front. Okay, so, so we have that kind of continued Japanese story. Um, often, um, and I think quite rightly so, um, we are um, kind of taught to think of um, the rise of Nazism and Hitler coming to power in Germany um, as a response to the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and in particular, um, the, the kind of territorial losses that Germany suffered, um, as well as all of the economic problems that were brought along um, because of the, the system of reparations payments that was part of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and and I, think, I think it's quite right to, um, to think of a direct connection between the treaty um, and the rise of Hitler. Um, I would suggest 
Well, and, and so by the time we're in World War II, then we're also in the Cold War. Um, so the, if we think about the Cold War as basically being an inability of the Russians and the uh, British, French, and Americans to come to a successful conclusion of World War II, um, they don't resolve that issue until uh, 1989. Um, that's actually, that, that's when the treaty that end, formally ends um, occupation of Germany and ends World War II happens, 1989. Um, so, okay, so we're still there, um, kind of seeing our connections between World War I, World War II, um, and the Cold War. Um, but then I'd also like to suggest that we think about some other kinds of conflict, um, that we think about um, uh, anti-colonial conflict or, or decolonization. Um, many potential examples here, but we can think about um, the war um, in Algeria for independence from France. Um, we can think about the Vietnam War, um, which starts initially as an effort to end French colonialism um, and then becomes more complex. Uh, we can definitely think about um, kind of ethnic cleansing in the 1990s, so Bosnia, Rwanda. Um, and arguably, we can think about the, um, the war in Iraq um, and all of these kind of conflicts. And I think, well, so the, um, you know, can we tie all that back to Versailles? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. um, and, and I'd like to, I think there's several ways to do this, but one, one important starting point here um, is for us to keep in mind that the Treaty of Versailles um, includes the covenant of the League of Nations. That's in fact the first part of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and of course the League of Nations is like the precursor to the UN. It's supposed to be um, an international organization that is helping countries avoid conflict because it provides a, um, a forum for arbitrating disputes, discussing disputes, um, and it also has a military component so that if one country gets attacked, all of the rest of them are supposed to come together to the aid of that country. Um, and also, if somebody um, deliberately starts a war, um, they can be penalized by the military strength of the others in the league. Okay? Um, so, you know, it, it is, in some ways, it's designed to be a um, sort of utopian form of world government where you can talk through your problems, um, but it also has a definite military component to it. Um, but I'd, I'd like to actually focus on a perhaps lesser talked about article of the, the covenant, which is in the treaty, um, and that is Article 22. Um, and I will read it to you because I know that that is very small here. So. To those colonies and territories which, as a consequence of the late war, World War I, have ceased to be under the sovereignty of the states which formerly governed them and which are inhabited by peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world, there should be applied the principle that the well-being and development of such peoples form a sacred trust of civilization and that securities for the performance of this trust should be embodied in this covenant. The best method of giving practical effect to this principle is that the tutelage of such peoples should be entrusted to advanced nations who by reason of their resources, their experience, or their geographical position can best undertake this responsibility and who are willing to accept it, and that this tutelage should be exercised by them as mandatories on behalf of the League. The character of the mandate must differ according to the stage of development of the people, the geographical situation of the territory, its economic conditions, and other similar circumstances. And this article then goes on to talk about different parts of the world. It says basically that in most of the former Ottoman lands, they're pretty close to being able to govern themselves. They're pretty civilized. Um, in Central Africa, mm, they're pretty far off. Um, and in the Pacific, they're, they're really far off, okay? And so what 
ultimately we're seeing here is kind of a, a re-entrenchment of colonialism, okay? Of the idea that some, uh, some countries and some peoples are superior to others um, and thus have a right to rule over them. Um, so again, we're seeing that um, especially in the Ottoman Empire, we have the mandate system that's put in place um, so, for example, the British have a mandate in Palestine, the French have one in Syria, um, and where those, the boundaries of the mandates are drawn um, is either arbitrary or with an eye toward um, the kind of natural resources at the area, kind of depending on which part of the line we're looking at. Um, it's not really paying attention to um, differences or similarities in, of the people um, who are living in those new regions. Um, and so it's creating kind of unusual or certainly non-traditional political structures, local political structures, um, but then also giving um, the Europeans uh, control over that. Um, and, okay, so, so the, we're extending colonialism. Um, the Japanese delegation at the Paris Peace Conference had tried to avoid this clause. Um, and in fact, they also tried to go a step further than that um, to have um, a clause that promised, um, guaranteed racial equality um, globally. Um, and that was rejected by the British, and the French, and the Americans. Um, the Chinese left the conference for quite some time after that, um, and the Japanese kind of scaled back their participation. Um, so we definitely have um, kind of a, a potential missed opportunity here. Um, but one of the things that makes it so challenging and so frustrating to a lot of people at the time is that the, the rhetoric of President Wilson and of many other people um, in fighting the war was that this was a war about self-determination, okay? And the way that the world was gonna be organized after the war um, was, again, kind of based on self-determination, that people would get to decide what their government was going to be. Um, Wilson used this word a lot. And he actually, he, re he lost control over it. Um, people that he had no intention of letting self-determine, um, they embraced this language. One of the problems with it is that it was never really defined, okay? So sometimes you hear it as national self-determination, sometimes just self-determination. Um, if you're thinking of a self, um, you might be thinking of an individual human being. Um, so none of this is clear. Um, and so that, that um, the colonialism is in there in the Treaty of Versailles. All of the problems with self-determination are a little bit harder to see when you're just looking at the Treaty of Versailles. But if you step back and look at the whole system of treaties um, that was put in place at the end of the war um, and some of the other kind of governmental policies that are put in place, I think you can see some of the problems more clearly. Um, so what, there is some places where um, there really is kind of self-determination by individual voters. So the Treaty of Versailles includes um, provisions for a number of plebiscites. Um, so, so like in different sort of border regions of Germany, um, they're going to have a vote of the people who live there about whether they want to be part of Germany, whether they want to be part of Poland, whether they want to be part of France, that kind of thing. Um, and so again, we have an actual democratic process here um, and with the idea that the people who live in this part of the world are capable of exercising that kind of decision-making process. Um, okay, so, Actually, my, my numbers are messed up. Oh, I missed something. Okay, well you see there, you can see where I'm going um, and I, it's not a big reveal anymore, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so what's really important to keep in mind is that the, the whole kind of European and American 
way of thinking that's really embodied in the Treaty of Versailles and its other related treaties um, is um, the idea of, um, of racial hierarchy. Again, that there are um, differences among peoples um, and there's a ranked difference. And when they talk about race, they are talking about that in a, um, a more um, capacious way than we might think of it. Um, so it covers um, what we might call race, but also ethnicity today. So they're thinking about Poles and Germans and Spaniards kind of all as separate races. Um, and so it's a kind of racial theory that um, facilitates colonialism. Um, but it also has the idea in it that members of a particular racial group are all fundamentally the same um, and that they're all, they all have the same sort of political will, okay? Um, and that political will is biological. Um, and so the idea for creating world peace, if you think that the world is organized in races this way, um, is to create racially homogenous nation states um, with the idea that to really have a truly functioning democratic society, everybody in the society needs to be a member of the same race. It's essentially, it's not majority rule, it's like democracy works because everybody thinks the same thing. Um, so, <laughs> um, but this is, this is deeply entrenched in the worldview of people who are participating at the conference. Um, and so it's really, um, there, there certainly are uh, places where this idea of, of racial homogeny is not followed. Um, in Austria, um, they have a plebiscite and they vote to join Germany. Um, but the British, French, and Americans don't let them do that. It's mostly the French that don't let them do that because they're concerned about Germany um, having too much strength, okay? But it also, I mean, the British and the French are, or, sorry, the British and the Americans, they think that was a weird decision. And so when 1938 comes along and the Germans take over Austria in the Anschluss, there's not a lot of objection to it because people are still thinking in these terms. So if the Austrians and the Germans all speak German, they must be all racially German and it would make sense if they were all in one country. Um, so, so in some places we have the plebiscites. As I've already said, we have kind of a re-entrenchment of colonialism, um, but one of the things that we see then as a result of World War I um, is we see a growing number of independence movements in various European empires. And typically at the time, those independence movements are also um, conceived of in nationalist terms. So they don't want a new kind of Ottoman Empire where you have a diversity of, of different people all in one state. They want um, a, an Arab state. They want a Korean state. They want um, a, um, a Moroccan state. Um, and that means then that not everybody who lives in that place is a potential legitimate member of that movement, okay? So it, it works to help kind of combat colonial, uh, colonial government, but also kind of to feed nationalism and nationalist violence um, in the, the parts of the world that are seeking independence. And then the other component of this that's coming out of the whole set of treaties harder to see when we're looking just at Versailles, um, is the way that border construction is done. Um, and so here, we should primarily be looking at Austria-Hungary, um, which again is, is kind of being approached as a country that's high enough in the racial hierarchy to be able to, to self-govern. Um, but the borders that are created are to create a, an Austria, a Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, 
and what's going to become Yugoslavia. Um, and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, on, on the face of it, it suggests that those are multiracial states, okay, because there's at least two um, different groups. But the way they are, they are pitched, the way the propaganda works to try and convince Western leaders that they should support these governments is to argue that basically the Czech language and the Slovak language are pretty much the same, so they're really all in the same race anyway, so it's going to be fine. Um, so, you know, they're, they are, they're consciously being pitched in those terms to the politicians who are going to make crucial decisions about which governments are going to exist. Um, and so we can see this kind of in the breakup of Austria-Hungary, um, but I think we should also kind of be looking for these same kind of ideas um, in one of the other subsets of treaties that comes out of the Paris Peace Conference, and those are the minority treaties. Um, so the new Czechoslovak state, the new Poland, um, they all have to sign treaties where they promise to protect the rights of the minority groups living in their country. Um, so for example, in Czechoslovakia, they have to protect the rights of Germans um, who are still living in the territory. Um, but the way this is expressed, um, the minority is a group, okay, it's not individuals. Um, and the whole kind of rhetoric surrounding it suggests that the country is there for the majority um, and that the minority is really not supposed to be there, okay? And that's an idea um, that's going to help legitimate violence um, for, for nationalist parties. We see it in World War II, we see it in, um, uh, in Bosnia in the 1990s, where the goal kind of is to try and create that state that doesn't have any minorities in it. We should also see this in immigration restriction, um, which at the time, so when World War I started, um, in many parts of the world, including the United States, um, you did not need a passport or a visa to cross an international border. Um, unless you were Chinese, um, where you couldn't get into the US. Um, and, but what we get out of World War I is, uh, well, first, an adoption of uh, temporary passports, but then most governments, including the United States, opt to make that system permanent, um, to make it more difficult for people to cross borders, to also make it clearer um, who each individual person was, um, and the United States adopts the national origins quota system for immigration um, in 1924 um, after kind of attempting it in 1919 and 1921 um, where the idea is to dramatically reduce the number of immigrants who can come into the country by giving each country in the world um, a certain number of quota slots, a certain number of people who can come in. And every country gets 100 um, but then if you get more than 100, it's, because, it's based on what percentage of people of that race were present in the US based on the 1890 census. Um, and it, it, statistically, it's very difficult to work this out, but the whole I, of idea behind it is that there are discernible racial categories and it's okay for some people to enter the country, but some people not to do so. Um, and those kind of restrictions are also being put in, um, in places uh, like Canada, Australia, um, South Africa, um, that are also like the United States, um, kind of white British settler colonies originally. And we should also be thinking domestically about what this looks like. This is the era of Jim Crow in the United States where you have that manifestation of, um, of racial hierarchy and segregation. Um, and it's also the um, a period of reservations and allotment, the process of breaking up reservations into smaller, uh, smaller units for individual use um, that's being um, Im implemented um, for dealing with Native Americans in the United States. And so all of this is really kind of coming from the same place. Um, this, this idea that had been generating um, more and more cultural authority kind of as the 19th century went on and into the 20th century, 
Um, and we really see it kind of um, crystallized and injected into the geopolitical system with the Treaty of Versailles and the related uh, treaties with other countries. And that really is this idea, um, well, it's, it's the idea of racial difference and racial hierarchy, but it fits with this idea of self-determination because the way that they're defining the self in this is a group of people. It's a race. It's not individual human beings. Um, and so we can see kind of over the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st and of legacies of having this idea really kind of at the heart of those treaties that were supposed to bring peace at the end of World War I. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or am I supposed to do this or okay, what? <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, I did not hear much about the reparation the gold marks that Germany had to pay that led into an economic crisis. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, where should I be? Is this okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so the, um, so the, the reparations payments, um, they're, they're um, basically what the British and the French in particular are aiming for um, is to have Germany like literally pay the cost of the war. So like the French want all of their stuff that had been destroyed rebuilt or returned. The Treaty of Versailles has very detailed instructions about how many sheep and how many telegraph poles are supposed to be given to France. Um, the British are particularly interested in having reparations to pay for veterans' pensions um, for the members of its armed services. Um, and so the treaty has um, Article 231, what's known as the War Guilt Clause, um, that, that says Germany is morally responsible for the war. Um, and that's kind of the legal innovation that's needed to then have all of these reparations payments, which are, are really kind of a, a new thing in international law. And the, the Germans attempt to pay them, and they, they can't, and it destroys the German economy. There's all sorts of inflation. Um, and the Americans a couple of times try and step in and renegotiate, um, and they end up with this awesome system that always blows the minds of my undergrads um, when I have this, this lovely diagram where the Americans are lending money to the Germans so the Germans can pay their reparations to the British and the French so the British and the French can pay their debts to the United States. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that works until October of 1929. Um, and then it all falls apart and we get the Great Depression. Um, and the, the, you know, the, this really, really does mess up the German economy and people are legitimately upset about it and looking for other solutions. You were talking about um, some kind of ideas going on about racial superiority and um, certain white Europeans are better than certain other peoples. Um, and uh, we were just having a discussion slightly before uh, the lecture about uh, the, I don't, I don't know if it's social Darwinism or not, but it's the eugenics movement and that it was okay at that time in the 20s and to um, sterilize people. And so th this kind of thing was um, common in our culture or uh, talked about. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's really quite everywhere. Um, and, and so you, you know, the, the first eugenic sterilization law is in Indiana in 1907. Um, so definitely, you know, World War I is kind of right in the era when that is happening. Um, and, and of course those, 
in the country as a whole, those sterilization laws um, disproportionately affect African American women. Um, I think there's approximately 60,000 African American women who were um, sterilized often and kind of without the without their consent. Like they went in, um, and the the white male doctor who knows best um, solved their problems for them. Um, so yes, it's definitely, it's, it's one of the elements of kind of implementing these ideas about race. And those ideas are everywhere. I mean, if you read the newspapers at the time, if you read novels, if you read trade journals, like everybody is trying to kind of talk about progress and civilization and their role in it. I mean, you can read trade magazines about the dairy industry and butter, um, and it's got progress in there and how the importance of good breeding and, you know, how the dairy, you know, supports the, the um, well, supports breeding better Americans as well. So yeah, it really is, it is quite pervasive. Um, and, and one last thing, so that's, that's kind of a generational shift. So the people who are born in the 1890s and thus are like right of military age in World War I, they're people who were born directly into that environment. They're not people who kind of grew up with still hearing abolitionist rhetoric um, in the United States. Um, and so we really see kind of in the teens, the 20s, the 30s, um, real, um, a lack of questioning of that sort of narrative. Yeah. I've got a question. Uh, I was unaware that the League of Nations had a military component. Was that ever used, or are there examples of that? Um, that's a great question. So if you, if you couldn't hear, the question was, um, did the League of Nations actually use its military component? Um, and basically, no. <laughs> um, and it, it wasn't like um, like a special League of Nations army. It would be that all of the different countries would need to contribute troops. Um, and so, of course, that's going to raise the hurdle of, of actually getting something done. Um, but um, because the United States wasn't in the league, the Soviets weren't in the league, the Germans didn't get to join the league until 1926, it never really like works in that way. Um, and when the league doesn't attempt to stop the Japanese in Manchuria in 1931, um, it's really over. But what the league does do, um, and that we still actually see results of their work, um, really is dealing with issues um, like um, uh, slavery and human trafficking. Um, they also developed kind of the first sort of international rules um, regarding the drug trade, in particular opium. Um, they're also important for kind of developing um, intellectual property regimes. Um, so they, they, they did get stuff done, um, and some of it is still very much with us, um, but not so much in the realm of security and, and military involvement. Uh, then, how come in the Vietnam War the Australians, the Koreans, and all of them were in there too? Wait. If you said the milita militarism stopped, oh. I mean we were there, and the and the Cor South Koreans were there, the Australians. Under what treaty? What? Okay, so so the League of Nations kind of piddles out in the early 1930s. Um, and then at the end of World War II, they try it again. And this time it's the United Nations. Um, and it, um, it works more than the League of Nations did. Arguably it still has lots and lots of problems. Um, but certainly the, the Korean War um, is, um, is articulated in the United States as a UN action, as a police action. Um, which is what allows uh, Truman to deploy troops without an actual declaration of war from Congress. <laughs>
I'd like to go back to your first slide about the, uh, did the Treaty of Versailles bring peace? And you said no. How do you define peace? Because <laughs> let, let me just make an, uh, an yeah. observation. Mm -hmm. We had, the world had more or less, if you define peace as the absence of hostility between 1918 and 1939, there was a, a lull where there was no real hostility. There were little local uprisings going on. But in the, I think you're talking about peace in the Wilsonian sense of all men living together as brothers. The world is never at peace. <laughs> there is no such thing as peace in that sense. Okay, so that, that's a great question. Um, and I would say that um, y one is right to say that in Western Europe, you don't have military conflict in the 1920s and 30s. Once you hit Eastern Europe, you have the continuing um, the um, Russian-related wars with the Baltics. We get the Spanish Civil War um, in the 1930s that becomes an international event. Um, you have the Italians um, in the 1930s um, invading Ethiopia. Um, you have continued fighting in the Middle East. We have American uh, military interventions in Haiti, in uh, Nicaragua, in the Dominican Republic. Um, so I, I think if we look kind of at a, in, a, in a very localized way, then mm, it brings peace for a while. Um, but I don't think it, um, it, it doesn't do the work of eliminating militarized conflict that that Wilson was envisioning for how the treaty with its League of Nations was going to work. Right. Just a quick question about uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, which probably is a separate lecture, oh, yeah. I'm sure, for him. <laughs> but I understand that around the end of World War I, when these negotiations would have been going on, he, he wasn't very well. Um, could, could you comment on how, that, how his health and well-being might have affected what uh, the political developments were. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so in a couple of ways. So he, um, well, so first when he goes to Paris in January of 1919, um, he actually needs to come home for about three weeks in February. Um, part of it is because of some domestic political issues, but more of it is that he has the flu. It's not like the Spanish flu. It's it, you know, it's hard to diagnose somebody's medical problems from a century ago. But when it comes to Woodrow Wilson, people have tried. There are multiple medical biographies of Wilson. Um, and okay, so in that sense, he's he's gone for part of the negotiations, um, and then he's in relatively good health for the rest of them. Um, but when he comes back and um, goes on the trail to try and get support. Um, he, as I, I mentioned before, he has a stroke, um, has to cut that tour short. Um, so th it's, the medical issues are definitely impacting the situation. Um, I would say that there's also, like, like the medical issues are kind of just sort of are the straw that, that uh, breaks the camel's back in terms of the impact of his personality and management style on the way he had been running the government and conducting U.S. foreign relations. Thanks. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for having me.